Hey everyone, I'm Joy. And I'm Jason. And welcome to episode two of our podcast, Over the Hill. Over the Hill is a podcast about our journey to cycling fitness, having started riding five years ago and just getting coached for less than a year. We also have a YouTube channel called Join Jason Rides, which is a visual recap of our races and events. Sometimes we can't really go in depth with our experiences in our videos, so hopefully this podcast can fill the gap. In the last episode, we talked about how we first got into cycling and gradually upgraded our equipment to be more competitive at races. Today, we'll talk more about the races we've done so far this year and a bonus segment for beginners with tips on how to ride on the road, the traffic, and what's the deal with bib shorts. So sit tight and enjoy the episode. Um, we're going to talk about our first race of the year this year on well, initially it was supposed to be in March. We were supposed to do a gravel fondo with three or four time segments, but we decided, I think there was like a big snowstorm uh, or rainstorm before that. So we ended up not going to it. So High Point is our first race of, or was our first race of the year back in May. And do you want to talk a little bit more about High Point? Yeah, it was, I believe, the first weekend of May, and High Point is a, a hill climb time trial that takes place in New Jersey. I believe the name of the town is, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but I'm I'm going to say it's Montague. Wasn't it something something that starts with an M? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, it's in New Jersey, um, about an hour and a half away from where we live in Connecticut. So it's relatively convenient for us to get there. And that's part of the reason that we, that we chose that event, but also because we had a good experience doing the Mount Greylock time trial at the end of last year. And so we wanted to do some more hill climb time trials this year. And High Point was the first one that was available on the calendar that fit into our schedule and was, you know, relatively easy for us to get to. Um, I, something else I'll mention is that there is something called the bump series bike up the mountain series, and it's a series of hill climb time trial races that take place in the Northeast. And it's roughly, it doesn't fall exactly one per month, but it's, it's roughly one event per month in during the non-winter months. And um, so we wanted to do a few of the events in this series because if you do three or more events that are included in this bump series, then you earn points toward the bumps competition. So... That was just kind of a little bit of an extra incentive to to do some different uh, hill climb races. So, you know, we chose High Point as our first race of the year. Um, and it's a... Did you want to talk about the, uh, the course itself or should I? Um, no, I can go ahead and do that. I have it up actually. Okay. So High Point, there's a segment on it on Strava, and it is 5.33 miles long, 4% average grade, and it ends at the top where there's the High Point Monument, which is pretty cool. It's supposed to be the highest point in New Jersey, and it overlooks this lake and the town below it, and it's really pretty. Uh, We reconned the course a few weeks prior to the actual race and uh it was pretty windy and cold at the top but that day of the race it was actually pretty comfortable um i believe it was like around the 50s or upper 50s low 60s which is an ideal temperature for me because i'm sure if you follow us on youtube and watched our videos i always talk about how i overheat and i always have trouble with keeping myself cool so that was an ideal temperature. Our coach actually had the the record uh, of it. Uh, she held it since 2012, and 
this year in particular, they were actually offering a $1,000 bounty to beat the men's record, which was 19 minutes and something seconds. Can't remember exactly what, how many seconds it was. And so there were a few people that signed up for it, like pros or former pros uh, that were attempting to you know, capture this, this $1,000 bounty. Unfortunately, it was only for the men's record. And I wish that they actually had one for women's record uh, because there was a, if you follow Zwift or if any of you watch the um, Zwift races on YouTube, sometimes they have it, you know, they, they have races on Zwift. Uh, there's a well-known uh, American Zwift racer named Kristen Kolchinski, who happens to be, who happens to live in New York. And so she's been doing a lot of these bump series and she was there and it was pretty cool. It was pretty neat to see her. And I talked to her for a little bit. So she was going for the women's record, which is what our coach held. Yeah. And um, before we get into our own performances, I'll just say that both the men's and the women's record got broken that day. Um, so there were some fast riders there, you know, on on both sides. But um, we never actually saw the male rider. Uh, his name is Eric Levinson. Uh, we actually never, I was looking for him. I don't actually know what he looks like, but I know uh, of him from different hill climb races. Um, Mount Washington, if any of you are familiar in the Northeast, um, pretty well-known climb in New Hampshire and Mount Washington. Um, I believe he either podiumed it or won a couple of times. So he, I knew him through that. Not that we've done Mount Washington, but um, yeah, I knew that name, but I don't really know what he what he looked like. And I actually never seen what he looked like because he finished it and he left. Yeah. And, and I don't know if this is true or not, but someone there was saying that he rode there he rode there did the the race and then rode off or something like that yeah i'm not sure <laughs> if that was true or not because uh i believe he's from boston so i'm not sure if that was true what of whoever this like some guy who was a marshal there mentioned it to someone and i overheard it and i'm not sure if that was entirely true but if that's the case that's yeah. pretty strong. Yeah, who knows? Because we never, we never, never actually saw him there. So, as far as we know, it's like there was some ghost yeah. showed up and took the record, and, and then was out. And just one more thing I wanted to add was that if you are interested in doing this event, um, there is a kind of logistics behind it. Just because our coach has done it a couple of times already, and she knew exactly like where to warm up. Um, where to start. Uh, so we actually started at the bottom of the climb. Uh, there is a large parking area, which used to be a, like a, I'm not sure if it was like a grocery store chain there, but it's currently, it's now empty. I guess the grocery chain closed and there's just a large parking area. So we parked actually at the bottom of the climb in that parking area and a number of other people did as well. And we warmed up on this road called Clove Road. Uh, it's it, it, relatively flat, there's a few rollers. Um, and that was a nice road to, to warm up on. Yeah, some people were warming up on their trainers in that parking lot. Um, we decided to, so far we have yet to bring our trainer to a race to warm up. I don't know if we'll ever do that or not but most of the races that we've been to we're able to find some place um nearby that's outside to warm up and like joy said in this case there was a road that we could warm up on that was pretty well suited for doing the warm-up so that worked out just fine and it was a little chilly that morning i was a little chilly starting the warm-up and i was wondering if i would have to wear leg warmers or arm warmers and vest and everything on the on the actual race but by the time I was finished with the warm-up I was starting to heat up and 
um, was actually feeling warm with some of those extra layers. So I, I took things off and just had the, the bib shorts and, and jersey, short sleeve jersey. And I felt slightly chilly with that, but I felt like I was warm enough where um, I could survive. Uh, I, I could survive without shivering, you know, on the start line. So and I knew that once once we got racing, that we'd warm up again. Uh, but I'm a little bit of the opposite of what Joy was saying earlier with um, in terms of temperature, ideal temperatures. I tend to do a little better when it's warm. Um, obviously, I don't want it to be 90 degrees and humid, but I would rather it be in the 70s than in the 60s or 50s. I just, for whatever reason, I just perform better when my body is warm. So do you want to go first and talk a little bit about how you did? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, it's got to be a pretty quick one because it was a 30 minute or so race. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't like, yeah, it's a 30 minute or so race and it's, you know, it's just a solo time trial uphill. So it's, there's not a lot of, um, you know, tactics going on or there is some strategy that each person takes, takes with them going into it as far as pacing. But that's, that's pretty much all you're dealing with is, you know, a pacing strategy. And my pacing strategy was to ride slightly above threshold um, most of most of the way up. Uh, the most of the climb is on a sort of a main road, and I'd say about maybe four first four miles of the climb is on a main road that's nice and smooth. Has some. Overall, it's a moderate grade. There's some some moderate uh, sections and and some actual. There's like a flat section in the middle where it actually goes a little bit downhill at one point and then uh, and then flattens out for for a stretch there, maybe half a mile or so. Um, so my my strategy was kind of to hold steady power during that first four miles maybe slightly above threshold and then when we reached the the park entrance um once you get inside high point park there's a there's a path that like it's sort of a walking slash bike path i think um that we turn on to and it's it's kind of windy and and hilly it goes you know up and down like a roller coaster so once you get into that section, it's kind of hard to to follow a pacing strategy because it's so punchy. So my idea was just to just to, to go as hard as I could on the, on those hills once I got into the park. You want to talk about what happened? Yeah. So uh, one mile. Yeah. So um, around around a mile in to the climb or a mile or so, uh, I started having these heart palpitations, which is some of you may have had something similar in your lifetime. Um, but if you haven't, it's, it kind of feels like your heart is fluttering and you sort of, it's like you feel this like fluttering sensation almost at the bottom of your throat. And, um, it's like a rapid heartbeat. And so that happened to me. And this isn't the very first time it's happened. There's been a couple of other times that, or I should say more than a couple. There was prior to this, there was one other time when it happened while I was riding. And then there was a handful of other times where it happened just randomly when I was at rest. And all of this, this sort of strange heart activity started. Um, I won't get you know too deep into it because you know, I know that the uh, the whole COVID vaccination thing is can be a touchy subject for some people. But um, but the first time that I 
the first time that I had these weird heart things uh, going on was shortly after getting my COVID vaccine. I don't know if, you know, if it's related or not or caused by that, but that's just the timeline of what happened. Um, so that was the first time that I experienced it was after getting the vaccine. And then that, that was in 2021. And then uh, about a year later in 2022, we got COVID and I was asymptomatic while I had the virus or while I was testing positive. Uh, but then, um, about a week or so after I stopped testing positive, I started getting these heart palpitations again, and um, they became a little bit more frequent than um, you know than the previous the you know year before that. Uh, and then since then, you know, I've had it you know a few times here and there, um, but it's you know something that. I have had uh, various um, cardiology tests uh, done since then. Um, I, I've seen a cardiologist and have had you know numerous tests. Uh, you know the the uh, echocardiogram. The I've had an MRI. Um, pretty much everything that they can test you for, aside from actually you know, doing surgery on you, I've had, and, um, and everything looked, looks normal when I get these, uh, tests done. Um, you know, the, the MRI looked normal. So, um, so anyway, um, you know, I decided I'm not going to let this, um, this weird thing that happens once in a while prevent me from, from doing what I like to do. So, you know, I've been continuing to ride and just kind of keeping an eye on it. And it's been quite a while since the last time that I had one of these episodes. And, um, but anyway, it, it happened for whatever reason at high point. And, um, so what happened was I was, you know, climbing along, not going, uh, you know, I didn't feel, I didn't, I didn't feel like I was going too hard or anything because I was, I was following my, my pacing strategy. I was going, you know, a little bit above threshold. Uh, My heart rate was, was in the 150s up until that point, uh, which is kind of, kind of normal for me at the beginning of a threshold type of effort. Um, You know, normally my heart rate will start in the 150s and then it'll climb into the 160s eventually. But in this case, it just went from, say, 155 straight up to um, into the 170s and then quickly went into, you know, got went over 180. And that's like very rare for me. It's like, the the highest I've ever seen my heart rate go, aside from these palpitation episodes, is you know around one seventy five or so. If you guys have seen the video, um, or if you haven't watched it, it is in our YouTube channel. Join Jason Rides, and we have the I have the power overlay on the climb, and you can also see the heart rate data, and you could actually see Jason's heart rate spiking up to one eighty two at some point in his ride? Yeah, so when it happened, I didn't feel any anything unusual aside from the palpitation itself. I didn't I didn't start feeling dizzy. I didn't wasn't short of breath. I mean, obviously I'm breathing a little bit hard cuz I'm doing, you know, a hard um a hard effort, but it didn't feel any harder than it would normally feel for that effort level. And, you know, wasn't having any particular trouble breathing. Um, and so, but it did take me by surprise. And when I saw the, the number on my Wahoo unit going up into the 180s, I'm like, oh, you know, this isn't good. 
and of course I could feel the the rapid beat and so I I panicked a little bit but because I've had this thing before and it never really turned any, into anything major I I quickly calmed myself down and I just told myself just just back off for a little bit um back off the power let see if your heart rate comes down and then just go from there so I did that my heart rate came down fairly quick um and you had to do a little cadence right yeah and then so what I did after that was uh I dropped my cadence so because this may be the case with everyone but something that I've noticed with myself is that when I ride at low cadence meaning for me less than like less than 80 rpms uh my heart rate is quite a bit lower than it would be if my cadence was higher so i just kind of use that uh that knowledge to to try to get myself through this this race at that point and uh once my heart rate settled down i just dropped my cadence and started going started going hard again but keeping my cadence low and I just told myself let's just see what happens with the heart and and um for the rest of the race it it stayed stable my heart rate stayed in the 150s um so I was able to I was able to complete the race and um I would say that I didn't I didn't go as hard as I really planned on going into it um, because I was I was still a little bit scared even though I did get my heart rate to calm down I was a little scared of what would happen if I pushed myself to you know to the edge so I I, I did what was kind of an, an 8 or 9 out of 10 effort rather than a 10 out of 10 effort and I made it to the finish line my time was just over 30 minutes which was a little bit slower than my goal not much slower my goal was to to break 30 minutes so i was pretty close and um and yeah i, I was a little bit disappointed at the end of it just because of the way things happened i felt like i didn't really get to uh to give it my full effort or you know i decided that i that it wasn't worth attempting that. So I, I feel like I left something on the table, but at the same time, I, I'm i proud of what I managed to do, you know, under the circumstances, I still came pretty close to my goal. So um, how about you, Joy? What what are your thoughts about your um Yeah, my, my performance was uh, pretty boring. Um, the, it was, I forget, I forget what the, the plan was. I believe it was a mile and a half first mile and a half or first half mile. I can't even remember. I was supposed to hold, uh, low, uh, the high, high threshold and which I did and I was fine and I, my legs felt really good and, uh, just continued on and I was, I, I think for, for that race, I had a lot of numbers in my head. Uh, our coach kind of gave me a, uh, just like a range of the power numbers of what to target. And it was kind of a lot for me to, to think about, especially when I, when I have to look at the distance and I got to remember, oh, what power am I supposed to be holding? And really what I should have done is maybe put like a sticker or something um, with the targets on my stem so that I have an idea and I don't have to kind of, I don't have to like think about it. It's like that way, all that mental, all that thinking is done for me when I have it written down. So it was half a mile threshold or upper threshold. And then after that, it was like 190 to 200. Um, and then the last mile, is to go beyond that. And I did a pretty decent job at 
holding my power. I actually, afterwards, when I finished and we came home, showered up and everything, and I looked at my numbers, I was pretty pleased with how it all turned out. I looked at my cadence and it was like flatlined. I was like, I was amazed at how, well, both of us, I was amazed at how we maintained that cadence um, or the power, I mean, not the cadence, but maintain that power in such a small range and which, um, I'm not sure if it has anything to do with pedaling efficiency, but it did kind of made me think, oh, okay, so I'm on the right track with how I'm pedaling. So, um, there was a section of the climb where the sun did come out. It was supposed to be a cloudy day and I was kind of like, looking forward to having a cloudy day that way it's not too hot but then the sun came out as we got closer to the top and I got really warm and I think I got it in my head and I was also thinking I'm kind of thirsty and I kind of need something and that's something that I I was always anxious about is not having a water bottle on me and I didn't have a water bottle on me because I made sure like nothing was on my bike just to keep the bike lightweight and uh so I sort of had that in my mind, like, I wish I could have a water just to sip. But, you know, so all these like negative thoughts started to to come in. And I was thinking, oh, I don't know if my legs can handle it. And my cadence, I actually did pretty decent with my cadence. It was like 90 RPMs all the way to the top. But I was nervous about my legs failing and then my legs failing to the point where I can no longer pedal. So it's like a mind, it's like mind games for me towards the end. And, uh, I had to, when we got to this, uh, it's not really a bike path, but there's a path that looks like, that's like roller coasters. It goes up and down, up and down. So you enter the state park and you make a right turn into this path. And there were some steep pitches there. And I kept thinking, I don't know if I could do this. I, you know, I got to the point where I'm just like suffering so much. My heart rate was at threshold the entire time. And, you know, I just kept thinking, I just want this to end. I just really want this to end. So from our recon, I knew that there were a couple of humps. Um, The first hump was really steep. And so I stayed seated, even though my coach said to get off the saddle. Uh, In hindsight, I maybe I should have, and I should have taken a better line up the steep part because I think I stayed to the right, which is the steepest part of this, this short kicker. And then after that, it's descending for a short bit. So I got a little recovery. And then from there, um, I got out of the saddle and I found, oh yeah, this is actually, this is actually a little easier than staying seated. So I was off the saddle, you know, breathing heavily. It was awesome because there were spectators on the side. They had their cowbells, just like in all these European races where they have uh, people on the side of the road just cheering us on. Um, but yeah, that was great to have them there. And then as I got closer to the top, I saw the finish line. There was a woman breathing behind me and I was like, Oh my God, she's going to catch me. And she almost did. She actually got ahead of me. And then somehow I found it in me to shift to a harder gear and just pedaled as hard as I could at the end and pretty much just emptied the tank there. So I had a set goal in my mind uh, to do 195 watts for, I finished in 32 minutes and I don't remember how many seconds, 46 seconds, I think, maybe I'm, I'm off, but I had my mind to do 195 watts. And unfortunately, um, I was off by a few watts. So I don't know why at the time when we were, when I got done, I was like, so so hung up over that. I was like disappointed in myself. Um, But I definitely think now that I have, um, this is the second time doing a hill climb. I have some idea of, you know, what I can do. It's just hard because I always think that I'm going to blow up. And one someday I'm just going to stop and just walk the bike. And that's like always the the fear of mine, the back of my my mind. And um, yeah, so all those negative thoughts just crept in. And I remembered watching the video again and I thought, well, man, I thought like that's, it's, you know, I I really need to work on that. So yeah, that's something that I definitely need to work on. And hill climbs are, 
I'm not a climber. And if you've ever seen me in person, I, I don't, I'm not lightweight. And I know that, but it is a weakness of mine that I want to work on. And so that's why I'm doing hill climbs is to be able to work on that, holding that power and that heart rate for a long period of time, just to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So I think I got a pretty good fitness bump from that. And uh, so I, I was disappointed, but you know, at the end of the day, um, now I'm looking back at it, it really was not a terrible effort. Just curious, do you, uh, cause I think, I think both of us experience this when we do these hill climbs where someone who started from behind us comes flying past us and, you know, and during our effort and you know, you're bound to have people passing you, um, because the way that, the way that they did the, the start times for this was just in alpha, I think it was alphabetical order by first name. So it's kind of random. Like they're not, they're not starting the fastest people at the front or anything. So you're going to have some people passing you along the way. I'm just wondering, does that, does that get in your head at all when you're doing this or? Oh, it definitely did. Yeah, it definitely did. And it's always, and I, I recognize that, but it's, a, it's hard to like shake off that feeling of like, wow, you're really slow. You know, when all these guys passed me and no other woman passed me, but, uh, you know, the first place woman, she passed me. She was the only one. But um, all these guys passed me and I just kept thinking, oh my God, you're, you're so slow. And so that was one of those things that I wish, that I, I'm definitely gonna work on as we continue with racing is to not get too discouraged with things like that because it's a, it is, it's not the end of the world. And I have to remind myself that it's not the end of the world when people pass you because it's going to happen and it's bound to happen. So just something to work on. Yeah, I think it bothered me a little bit more when we did Greylock last year. There were a bunch of guys flying by me and it made me feel slow. But I ended up having a pretty good day for, for me at Greylock. So going into this one, having people pass me didn't bother me quite as much because I was kind of just resigned to doing my own thing anyway. Um, but... Yeah, the 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 winner of the women's race passed me at the end. Uh, a, a few guys passed me along the way, also, but um, the women's race winner passed me at the end, uh, somewhere b a little bit before the finish line in the park, and I was totally fine with that. I was like, "Good for you, <laughs> you're flying," and I just there's, yeah, she was, there's no way I can go that fast. So it's good for you. Yeah, she actually after I talked to her, um, I f friended her on Strava, and she friended me back, and she posted briefly a her her video with power overlay, and and then for some reason she took it down. But, or maybe she wanted to hide the information, even though she has her power numbers on Strava. But um, we were watching the video and she was doing, you know, pretty decent power being lightweight. So she was out of the saddle and she looked like she was just, she had like, she looked like she was jet propelled <laughs> from that video. Yeah, her average power was probably close to mine or maybe even slightly more, and she probably weighs half what I weigh. So, uh, she's, yeah, kind of crazy. Um, so, yeah, that's high point. The next one uh, we had a week after that, right, was Mine Hill. Or no, not uh, a week after that, no, a few weeks after. No, it was a few weeks after. Um, it was actually... May, late May. It was Memorial Day weekend right. was Mine Hill. So High Point was the first week of May. Uh, Mine Hill Gravel was the last week of May and Memorial Weekend, Memorial Day weekend. And that one was a, that one's a cool race. It's a gravel race and it's only 20 minutes from our house. 
It's run by Steep Endurance, and Steep Endurance is known for their trail running races. And so this initially started out as a half marathon trail race, and they added a gravel portion to it, which is really cool. So you do laps of this half marathon course in Roxbury, it goes into a little bit into Washington, Connecticut, and uh, pretty hilly course. Uh, the riders start first and then the runners start after that. And for the gravel race, there are two distances offered. So you can do two laps of the 13 mile course, uh, which is 26 miles, or you can do three laps of that, which is 39 miles. Um, so you just do laps of the same course. So you hit the same two steep hills uh, each lap. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, I guess, good and bad uh, because it, it's good in that you, once you get the feel for the course, you know, doing one lap, then, you know, the subsequent laps, you know exactly what's, what's coming. So there's no surprises, but, um, you know, mentally it's kind of tough going into those climbs the second or or third time if you're doing the 39 mile when you you hit those climbs again you know that it's gonna probably feel harder than it did the first lap and you know each lap is gonna feel harder um so you really you you have to something we've learned this year you know about that that course is you have to conserve your power for specific spots of the course we did this race last year also Uh, we did the 39 mile one last year and uh, um, when i did it it was pretty tough because i was trying to go with the front group which i shouldn't have been doing because i was nowhere near the fitness of people in the front group at the time last year and so i got up Uh, I did my first lap was okay. Second lap was okay. And then the third lap I blew up. And I think part of it is just uh, bonking or not sure if it was bonking or I also had, I got cramps, leg cramps um, on the, one of the little short uh, pitches of, of the, the course. And I was caught by the second place woman and pretty much finished I don't know, two minutes behind her last year. And it was, so it was tough. Um, I got third place last year from that. And I remembered seeing the woman who got first place. She got this really awesome plaque that said first place woman. And I remember thinking, man, I want that. (laughs) Like, that's what I want to work for this year, uh, for the following year. So that this year, that was really, my goal was just to really, to get that, that plaque. And uh, we decided to do the two lap, uh, we decided to do two laps of it, which makes sense because we haven't really done long, hard, intense rides. So two laps would roughly be less than two hours. And prior to the race, uh, I've been doing a lot of rides on this course because it's 20 minutes from us and I figured I'm going to do all my workouts there because why not so my coach prescribed me a couple of vo2 max um, intervals but she won a few weekends she did prescribe me hard gravel ride and that was to do either threshold or vo2 on the climbs which I did and I you know just wanted to see how it was going to feel and I remember doing them and it was like, you know, it's really hard as you guys know, if you, you know, for those of you who've done VO2 max intervals, long VO2 max intervals are, are hard. It's harder than, it's just as hard as doing a long hill climb time trial race, you know, cause you do such high power for yourself. I mean, for my own, it's high power and you're doing it for six, seven minutes, sometimes even eight minutes. And it's hard to hold that. And eight minutes is nothing compared to 32 minutes time trial or an hour time trial because you're holding a certain power at threshold. But 
you know, when a gravel race or this particular workout I did, I, it's just overall hard. It's just like you, you get to the point where you want to puke at the end of it and you feel like you can't do another one and then you end up doing another one. <laughs> so I, um, I think my coach prescribed me some really good workouts prior to this and and it also helped that I was doing a lot of my a lot of my gravel rides on this course also because I knew I wanted to study it even though I did we've done this course multiple times I wanted to study what sections what part of the Shiner Mountain being the first hill that we hit what part of Shiner to ride on and how to ride it, how to pace it, uh, because it's also narrower than West Churchill. And it's hard to, it, Shiner is hard because when you ride past the runners, they are walking or running on the right side of the, of the hill. So you have to move over to the left side, which is steeper. And it's harder to find a good line doing that especially when you're stuck behind other riders so I had to really be um, I had to really think about what how to ride different parts of that climb and not spin out or um, you know not get to the point where I might have to unclip because I'm behind someone who isn't going faster than I wanted to and then I end up stopping so that didn't happen thank goodness um, but yeah, so I think my coach really did a great job with preparing me for this. So I know Jason didn't get the same workout that I did because I know something happened with him after with High Point. So you want to share to the listeners what happened? So shortly after High Point, I would say a few days, I think it was a few days after the High Point race, um, I started having a, I felt a sharp pain in my, above my right knee when I went to sit down one day. And it was kind of odd because, you know, I had done, I had done a, a, a bike workout on the trainer, I think that morning felt totally fine. And then later that day I go to sit down on the couch and I feel this sharp pain, um, where it was what felt like my knee or above my knee and um kind of shook it off at first I was like eh, it's just just some kind of weird thing it'll go away and then didn't didn't go away um and you know it, it stuck around for a few days wasn't getting any better uh so I went to to see our coach about it because she's, she's also a physical therapist and um well i should say first i went to see um the orthopedist who uh dr dare who i've seen in the past to for surgery on my collarbone and and also for consultation on my um the previous knee issue that i had years ago so i went to see him um he he diagnosed it as uh, quad tendonitis, and then I went to see our coach for physical therapy, and um, she uh, she evaluated it, um, put some some KT t some KT tape on it, had me do some exercises, um, and. In the following days, um, days or weeks, she adjusted my training. Um, the The pain started to go away, so you know I, I I started training again. But she had me doing pretty much all high cadence work. Um, I did do all of my rides were were fairly short. I didn't do any long endurance rides and. Um, my workouts were, were all pretty much high cadence, you know, tempo or threshold type workouts, nothing like 
super intense and nothing, um, you know, with a big gear where I'd be putting a lot of stress on, on the knee. Um, and that actually worked out very nicely in terms of maintaining my fitness. Um, so leading up to mine Hill, I didn't get the specific preparation that I wanted similar to, I wasn't able to do the, the hard gravel rides that joy was doing, uh, where she was reconning the course. Of course, it's not like I really need to recon that course because we ride we ride there a number of times. Aside from doing the race last year, we ride there on a, a fairly regular basis when we do gravel rides at home because it's close by to where we live. So I really didn't need to recon the course. I knew I knew the course already. It would have been ideal if I was able to do some uh, to do some hard rides on the course, though, just to you know to have those hard efforts going up Shiner Mountain. But you know, I wasn't really that just wasn't in the cards for me because I had this little knee injury, minor knee injury going on, and I think that our coach did the right thing in prescribing me the training that she did because it it managed to keep my fitness pretty much where it was after my, uh, after high, high point, um, it kept me from losing fitness. And so at least I had that going for me. Yeah. And I think you had pretty, um, fresh legs too. You know, you, you that's probably one yeah. of the things that uh, went for you is that having fresh legs, you still maintained that fitness. Yeah. So that was, that was part of the reason why when I signed up, I signed up for Mine Hill kind of last minute because I was waiting to see how the knee would heal up. And a few days before the race, I felt like I was 100%. You know, I was I was feeling no pain at all anymore. So um, I decided, you know, I signed up for the race and I signed up for the, the 26 mile as sort of a precaution because, you know, I was, and I, it just made more, more sense for me to do the 26 mile because, you know, obviously you don't want to, if you're coming off of an injury, you don't want to, you want to minimize the amount of, uh, stress you're going to put on your body. And, you know, I also didn't have high volume training leading up to that. So my endurance probably would have been a little bit lacking if I did the, the 39 mile distance. But doing the 26 mile, I had, I had good enough fitness to do that distance. And like Joy said, my let my legs were pretty fresh going into the race. So, um, my legs actually felt great on, on race day. And since, since I knew the course, it didn't, didn't bother me that I wasn't able to recon it. Yeah. It was similar to last year. The start of that was hard and <laughs> Uh, I, I, uh, there is a woman who won the 39 mile one last year. She wrote it and we actually, I've written, we've written with her. Her name is Katrina. She was a former, she's a former coach. I saw her, she was, I was right behind her and I wanted to hang on to her wheel. And then, you know, it never goes the way you want it to in the, in the beginning, because there's all these people who are riding and it's harder to like ride around them. And so I got stuck behind this guy who had some issues with his bike but he was going at a pretty decent pace and uh so i stuck behind him drafted and then i decided to just let him go and uh because the front group was you know going pretty hard decided you know let's me just sh save my legs for shiner and west churchill because i know those two climbs are still gonna come up so I ended up dropping back and uh, found a group and then Jason found me and uh, I drafted a cup with a couple of guys and it's hard to, you know, the, the mindset behind this was there weren't that many women doing this race uh, and so there were a lot more men so my, my plan was to just draft behind as many men as I can 
and just race them instead of uh, instead of the women because it's easier for me to to find a group of guys than a group of a group of men of women um so that was that was the plan was to just hang on to as many wheels as I can and uh yeah so Jason caught me yeah so I got uh, I got similar to last year I got way off the back at the after the the starting line uh because I just I think I get nervous when we're you know starting out kind of in a starting out in a you know a pack and the the start and finish area of this course is kind of like loose rocks like small small loose rocks it's so like it's, yeah loose gravel yeah loose gravel so it's like the same kind of rocks that you would put in your driveway if we wanted yeah. like a gravel driveway instead of a paved one yeah um so it's it doesn't have you know the best traction in the world so i just get a little i get a little nervous when i'm you know close to other riders with that kind of surface and then so i'm a little timid coming off of the start line and you know i got off get way off the back and then i tried to uh i tried to get behind a few guys to to get you know back into a into sort of the middle of the pack, but never really got there. And then um, I ended up finding the small group that Joy was riding with, uh, rode behind them for for a little bit, kind of conserve some energy. Um, and then when we got to Shiner Mountain, um, one of those guys kind of started out side by side with me and he eventually you know went ahead of me but he was he was going up the climb at pretty much the same pace that i wanted to go so i just kind of um i didn't necessarily follow his wheel because i actually thought that he was not taking the best lines um probably because he he probably doesn't hasn't ridden the course as many times as we have but it, it he was taking some lines that were either in more like sandy sections or they were steeper so i i didn't w necessarily want to take the same lines he was taking but i was just kind of using him as a pacer and trying to leave you know a small trying not to leave like a big gap between us and i was just you know sort of using him to pace myself um so that that worked out uh that worked out going up shiner mountain and west churchill i did pretty much the same thing um when we got to the top of west churchill he got a little bit of a gap on me a little bit of a bigger gap and then going down the descent uh from there's like a paved road descent um from west churchill down to i i don't remember the name of the road that um that you descend back onto but it's a gravel road that then brings you brings you back the other way you know looping around toward the where you started from and um you know I'm kind of a slow descender you know I'm I I tend to be kind of cautious on descents uh so this guy also descended faster than I did so I pretty much lost him and by the time you know I got to the bottom of, of that descent I was by myself which um, I kind of figured I would be in that position at some point because that's what happened to me last year. And, you know, I knew that even if I had gotten in a bigger group at the start of the race, I was probably going to get dropped by at least most of the riders on Shiner Mountain um, just because it seems like and it seems like every race we do there's guys that just blasted up these hills and I just can never follow them without blowing up. Uh, so I kind of figured I was going to get dropped on that climb anyway. And, you know, if I was really lucky, there might've been a few people that also got dropped and then, you know, I could group together with them later on. But, um, you know, I figured most likely I was going to end up solo at some point. So that's what happened to me again here. Um, 
And I was okay with that though, because this next section of the course, that's a, a gravel road that takes you back toward Judge Bridge and then back to the you know beginning of the course is a slight downhill overall. I mean, it's kind of rolling, but you know, the, 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 tr the net trend is, is a little bit downhill. So it's kind of a fast section of the course. If you, with an asterisk there, there are some potholes on that section. And if you don't know the course, you might get sort of tripped up by those potholes and have to slow down to, um, you know, when to, if you're going over them or having to swerve around them. But I pretty much knew where all the potholes were so I could, I could avoid them ahead of time before, I, before going over them. So I was able to, I knew I'd be able to ride the, that section of the course pretty fast, even being solo because I could just, you know, get into more of an aero position and just do some sort of tempo power and, you know, pick good lines going through that, that gravel to, um, to avoid those potholes and, you know, where I wouldn't have to slow down for them. Um, so I, I made pretty good time going through that section and I ended up, um, catching back up to the guy who dropped me on the climb, um, right as it starts, uh, the gravel road starts going back uphill, um, from, this is on Judge Bridge Road, heading toward Century Hill Road, which is a paved road. And there's like a short, short little climb going up the end of Judge Bridge there. And, um, I started out behind this, this guy that dropped me on Shiner Mountain, um, again, and this time I, f I'm not sure if he was getting tired or something, but this time I felt like I could go faster than him up the climb. So I decided to just, you know, go ahead rather than, than following him. So I went around him, um, went, you know, pretty hard up that climb. And then my plan was to just, you know, coast down, um, when you, when you get to the, the top of that, top of that little hill, then it goes slight downhill before you make a right hand turn onto Century Hill Road. And so my plan was to kind of smash it up the hill, then on Judge Bridge and then coast down, you know, make the turn onto coast down, get a little recovery, make the turn onto Century Hill and then start and then just sort of reevaluate at that point, see if there's anyone else riding that section that I could get behind or if I'm just going to time trial it myself. And so I'm going down this, uh, this last piece of Judge Bridge Road about to turn right onto Sentry Hill. And I probably was going a little bit too fast going down there. At the time, it didn't feel like I was. You know, because I was just coasting and I was, um, you know, kind of feathering the brakes, like trying to keep my my speed under control. Because, you know, again, I'm I'm not really a fast descender, and I didn't think I was really descending this thing that fast. But I guess I wasn't careful enough, and uh, making the right hand turn, that I'm going from gravel to pavement. And there's some loose dirt that kind of creeps onto that paved road section right where you make the turn. And I think what happened was I didn't slow myself down earlier in the descent. So I probably, meaning I wasn't feathering the brakes enough. And when I got toward the turn, I felt like I was still going too fast. Uh, so... I kept holding on to the brakes as I, as I turned to the right. And when I went over this loose dirt, I basically just slid out. I mean, the, the, the tires, the tires slid out from underneath me. Uh, I went down on my right side and, uh, ended up with some, some cuts and road rash on my right 
elbow and forearm and my right um, hip slash you know upper thigh and uh, I, I also felt like I banged my hip a little bit but it didn't feel like anything was broken you know I felt like okay I, I'm probably gonna have a bruise or something but I didn't you know I was able to walk it didn't feel like anything was broken but you know, I had some some reasonably deep cuts um, that were bleeding and um, so I wanted to get those bandaged up at least to, so that it wouldn't bleed too much fortunately there was a course marshal right at this intersection um, probably because it was a sketchy intersection uh, so they placed the, the course marshal there um, it was you know a good idea for them to place someone there and so there was a course marshal there and he was able to help me with some first aid supplies to, you know, wrap my, um, wrap my arm up. And I was able to get back on the bike and ride back to the starting point where I could get some additional, um, so medical supplies for, you know, to help clean, clean the wounds and, and bandage them up, um, but as best I could. Uh, but at the, after having that crash, I kind of decided, you know, my race was over. Um, I didn't really, you know, again, I didn't think that I broke anything, but at the same time, I did have some pain in my hip and I was able to ride, although I was able to ride, it didn't feel, you know, normal. And, um, you know, that combined with the fact that you know, I had already probably spent five or 10 minutes getting, you know, bandaged up before I started, got back on the bike. I figured, well, at this point, you know, my, uh, you know, my, my race time is, is going to be a lot slower than it otherwise would have been. So, you know, it doesn't make sense to continue to push myself when I'm, I'm not going to get the result I want at that point anyway. Uh, so yeah, that was the end of my race, um, ended up, you know, not finishing. And that was, uh, that was disappointing because, um, you know, obviously that's a bad way for anyone to end, to end a race. You know, it's no fun to crash. Um, but to, you know, rub salt into the wound further, um, I felt like I was having a good day up until that point. You know, I was you know, my legs were feeling good. I was, um, you know, I felt like my power was there and my speed was there. I was at the point where I crashed, I was on a significantly faster pace than I had been on each of my laps last year. So I think if I had been able to finish and, and by the way, I wasn't anywhere close to being on the limit. Um, in you know in terms of uh fatigue so i'm pretty confident that i could have done the second lap at a similar pace to the first lap and uh if i had completed the race i would have had you know i would have had a much faster lap time than than last year so it would have things were definitely going in the right direction from a performance standpoint but unfortunately, um, you know, it didn't, uh, I didn't have much to show for it cause I, I wasn't able to finish. So that was kind of, um, that was my race at Mine Hill and I'll let Joy, uh, talk about the rest of it because, um, she has a quite a bit, I think more to, to discuss in terms of performance. Well, I don't know about that since we were an hour in over an hour into the podcast. Um, all I just want to say, just want to keep it short. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> I won the race for the women's and I got the plaque. That's all I wanted. But I also got a, I also got a bunch of booze and um, really cool stuff from the race organizers. So, you know, I was pretty thrilled with that. And I think... I'm also pretty thrilled with my overall performance and how I played that to my advantage 
having done the course multiple times and knowing when to conserve energy. And, uh, you know, it's all about having, you know, it's not a super technical course, but you still have to have some bike handling skills to be able to, to handle some of the twisty descents. And, uh, you just got to have the legs to climb those steep hills. And I think I had, you know, the line, the stars lined were aligned for me that day. And I, uh, averaged 148 Watts for an hour and 47 minutes. I actually finished in an hour, 48 minutes and some odd seconds. Um, first place woman, fifth overall. And so I'm pretty happy with that overall as in also including men. Um, so, you know, my, my plan of racing men kind of worked for me. And, uh, I, I know that I still have a lot of work to do if I wanted to do the three lap course for next year, I still have much more work to do. I definitely need to build that volume up for next year, but Right now I'm kind of like on a high uh, with with that win. And uh, so yeah, average 148 watts and my normalized was 170. So that's the highest I've seen it. And uh, yeah, like I said, I played it to my advantage. I think I raced at smart. The beginning was not so smart, but that's something that needs to be worked on for next year. Um, but yeah, you know, pretty happy with it. I think it was your, also your highest average speed for a gravel ride, right? Yeah. Uh, 14.7 miles per hour. Um, so I, I really, you know, I, I know that high point, I think really helped to boost my fitness and, you know, I've been having done a couple of hard gravel rides on that course also helped. And, uh, and I got to say, you know, sometimes when people say that you don't win on descents, but you know, you have to have some form of, you know, you have to have good descending skills to be able to put time into people. And I didn't really have a lot of people around me the second, after the second lap, I was kind of left on my own and I looked around and I didn't see anybody. So I didn't know where I was in terms of like placing. I, d I did, I do recall dropping a few guys, but you know, I don't know how many of them are doing the 39 mile versus the 26 mile. So all I knew was that I had a set time goal, which was an hour and 55 minutes since last year, I believe I did an hour and 57 minutes. And so I was pretty conservative with my goal and having beaten that time goal by, you know, at least seven minutes. I'm pretty pleased with, with that. So yeah, I'm pretty thrilled. Yeah. That's the, the one thing that, um, that I wish was different about that race was it would be if the, the two different distances, the 39 mile and the 26 mile, if they would either start at different times or if maybe they had, you know, different color, uh, number plates or something like that for, for each distance. But I don't think you would be able to see the number plates because it's in the front of their bikes. If they had different color oh. number plates. Oh, that's right? I mean, you're, cause you're either oh. beso beside them or oh. behind them or if you're, Oh, that's right. Cause we didn't actually have something on our, the back of our Jersey. Um, Anyway, it's it, it's a little bit you know, hard to know where you, especially if you're if you're if you're if you're doing the twenty six mile race, it's kind of hard to know where you actually stand within that race because you could be riding with people that are actually doing the thirty nine mile race, and you don't really know if like are you actually competing against them or you know are they just are you just kind of there with them and you're not actually competing against each other? So it's, it's a little bit confusing in that sense. Like you don't, it's hard to tell who you're, um, if the people you're riding with are actually your competition. 
but yeah, I think that was, um, it, it's still, it's, uh, I, th well, speaking for myself, it's, it's still one of my favorite events that we do. And I'm sure if Joy didn't feel that way prior to this year, she probably feels the same way now since she won the race. I'm sure she, she likes it. No, I mean, I really like the course. I like that it was a circuit. Um, you know, so you knew exactly what was going to happen, what was going to, uh, what the terrain was going to be like. It's just a matter of, you know, do you have the fitness to, to execute, you know, your plan, your goal. And I, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, I was on a high that day. So I, um, but we unfortunately had to mend Jason's injuries from that and he had to go to, ur uh, to urgent care and then well not to urgent care to the er to to be taken care of and um so you know that was pretty much that was pretty much our day so which kind of leads us to this conversation that we had in the past about how we used to ride um we in the past we would i think this is all from the over glorification on youtube about the suffering and how you know suffering is good and when you're on the bike and we were in the past we would do such big rides you know we would do a century ride or two in a year you know we trashed ourselves from that um, and it was like this feeling of like, yeah, we accomplished something. We're tired with the, at the end, but this year we're kind of focusing a little bit less on the long distance and more on shorter distance events and shorter in a sense, like it's like 40 miles, 20 miles, 40 miles less than what we would normally do. And so far, I think that it's been working well in actually improving our our fitness so more isn't always better when you're talking about being amateur cyclist cat four cyclist you know like doing more volume in races isn't always the best thing especially if you don't have the training to back up that you know training behind that race so that's why we've been focusing on shorter distances this year or we will be focusing on shorter distances for example the hill climb time trials and then dropping the mileage with mine hill and uh in the future we'll still you know we're not this year we're not going to do any century rides um, and that's because it's just harder to recover from these hard rides. And I did a, uh, last weekend, I did a pretty hard, a long, hard ride. And the, the prescription was do 50 miles with four to 5,000 feet of elevation gain and do tempo or threshold on the climbs. And coach said, find hills. And so... I did the hilly route in real life and I was so trashed from that after doing that. I was like, I w it was hard. It was just like, it took me a couple of days to recover it. One, I, I had a saddle sore, so I had to recover, you know, I had to make sure that that was healed up. And two, it was just like so um, depleting for me. And that was the only you know, that was only a 50 mile ride. And I just want to say only 50 mile ride, but you know, there was also a lot of elevation gain from it. So it does, you know, these century rides, even though in the past we would do them pretty slow. Um, our power was really low. My, our speed or my power was low. My speed was low. It's, it's just law. It's just harder to recover from long rides. And so you know, just we just need to to build our our fitness up before we actually start doing these big rides or races. Yeah, and we didn't do century rides every week, but I mean, we we used to do some sort of long ride almost every week where we would 
be out there for, you know, four or five hours at least. And, you know, we would do that every weekend and pretty much every weekend I'd feel, I would feel like I had to take a couple of rest days, you know, say if we did a long ride on Sunday, I felt like I had to take two rest days before you could, before I could start training again. Um, whereas, you know, if this year we're just keeping the endurance rides, you know, a little more like two or three hours most of the time. Sometimes, you know, we hopefully this summer we'll work it up, you know, a little bit to, you know, maybe four hours or so. Um, but keeping it at a, a manageable, a manageable volume where we don't feel like we're trashing ourselves every weekend. It just makes it easier to get back into training, uh, sooner the, you know, the following week. And then you can kind of slowly, you know, build upon your fitness, you know, week by week, just chip away at it. Yeah. And I think that's a big, like beginner's mistake, you know, from with riding such doing such big rides, you know, when people do big rides on Strava, but it's like, Oh my God, that's awesome. Good for you. Great job. And, you know, obviously we're not, um, you know, we're not saying that you shouldn't do big rides. You could totally do it. And, um, you know, we've obviously done it, but just don't feel like you have to, right. You're not ready for it. Right. And, and to do, to actually do proper training, you have to be able to, you know, induce stress, your body, stress your body, and then back off a little bit and continue to do that until you have a recovery week. And so the idea is to stress your body enough where you get that, um, where you get the adaptations and then back off a little bit and then stress your body again. And if you're constantly, if you're stressing your body too quickly, you back off two days, maybe you're riding an hour, you know, on the third day, and then you can't ride anymore because you're so tired, then you're not continuously stressing your body. So it's just a gradual buildup. And, um, you know, learned our lesson the hard way. And uh, I know that I definitely put on, put more miles in this year so far than last year. I'm looking at, you know, Strava has a way of showing how many hours you spend in riding in a month. And I know when I compare it from last year's, it's definitely, this year is definitely higher than, than last year because it's just that continuous riding you know you're even if you're riding for an hour you're building your fitness that one hour ride matters you know even the 45 minute easy spin matters even though you know (laughs) this week is my recovery week thank goodness and you know i like to recover hard i know that's what i call it today it's like i don't when andrea prescribes 45 minute easy spin or day off i'm taking a day off and it's just a way for me to just make sure my body is fully recovered and ready for the following week's workouts. Um, so do you want to, do you think we should? So maybe we'll hit up a couple of these the tips for beginners next time. Yeah, I was going to say, why don't we do a separate podcast for, for that and then maybe add some other tips to it and just have a separate topic for that well the next podcast we'll probably talk about the fondo the road fondo that we did a few weeks ago highlands and then we'll talk about the tips for beginners so sorry we could not talk about that today i it was a bit of a long um yeah i think going forward maybe we need to if we're talking about races we should just do one per yeah per podcast Thank you everyone for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please follow us, subscribe, rate, like, and so on to help this podcast. You can follow us on Instagram at Joy and Jason Rides with no space in between. You can follow us on YouTube at Joy and Jason Rides with a space in between Joy and Jason. And Strava, you can find Jason at Jason Pyers, myself, Joy Pyers. 
I'll link all of that in the show notes below. As always, don't forget to enjoy your rides.